Hello and welcome. So this is a new video, a new lecture um, in the maternal medicine lecture series. And today we are going to talk about cardiac diseases with pregnancy. It's a huge topic. So we basically, we're not discussing everything related to cardiac disease with pregnancy. And there is likely, um, there will be more lectures specific to some diseases in um, the cardiac category. But here we're just giving like very broad recommendations, advices related to cardiac diseases. It's going to be really very brief and um, condensed. And hopefully it's going to be um, an easy and a straightforward lecture for everyone. So let's get started. So first thing, um, as I said, cardiac diseases, this is a very broad term. So many diseases that can happen with pregnancy. Um, but to start with, let's just categorize how bad that could be. Because basically it's, it's not the same if a patient is having, for example, like rheumatic heart disease, it's not as bad as necessarily as bad as like a myocardial infarction, for example. So in this slide, we're actually showing um, how each of these categories contribute to um, like the total deaths uh, from cardiac diseases in pregnancy. And as we see here, probably the worst are ischemic heart disease slash myocardial infarction. This is uh, contributing by 33%. One third of this is related to cardiac disease in pregnancy. Same for peripartum cardiomyopathy, which we're going to discuss later on in um, this lecture. So both of them really contributing significantly to maternal deaths related to cardiac disease. And of course, uh, we don't want to miss um, a particular category, not as common, but it's really serious, which is um, aortic dissection. And as we will discuss later, it's, it's actually one thing that we can see, especially in patients who are diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. Um, so this is one of the worst actually diagnoses that would um, happen in pregnancy, unfortunately this is more of a, an acute um, situation rather than like a known disease in pregnancy. Uh, but just to be aware of this term, aware of um, whom are at high risk of having aortic dissection. So the other categories, um, congenital heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension, each of them contribute by about five to 10%. Um, and maternal mortality is related to cardiac diseases. It's important to say that congenital heart diseases are almost 1% of all pregnancies. It's still, it's not a huge percentage, but it's, it's definitely um, a significant one. Um, and again, I mean, um, this percentage is actually increasing because back in the days, uh, it was very unlikely to see congenital heart diseases, especially significant ones with pregnancy. That's because um, of the mortality rate related to congenital heart diseases and the likelihood of like, or I would say that's unlikely for most patients to actually make it till the age of childbearing. Uh, but now with the surgeries, with the advancement in this, um, uh, in this category and how we manage congenital heart diseases, this increases life expectancy and gets like increases the chance of women making it to the 20s and 30s and getting pregnant and um, giving birth to children. And that's why this percentage is likely to increase um, over time. Uh, it's very important to highlight traumatic heart disease, guys, because um, in certain populations, in certain countries, it's just part of the culture. It's like every single doctor knows that there's always a chance of rheumatic heart disease in a pregnant lady. Uh, in developed countries, um, their mind are not totally set to expect rheumatic heart disease. And that's true, but you should understand that rheumatic heart disease, I mean, if you're seeing a patient with no medical records, a patient coming from a different country, just arriving recently to whatever, the United States, the UK, Europe, doesn't matter. Um, if, if there's a new patient to the population, if she's coming from a different population um, and if she doesn't have any medical records or like you, do, you don't trust how she was um, followed up and managed since she uh, was born, then I would say, yes, just 
be aware of rheumatic heart disease as a possibility, especially if you start having symptoms. We always recommend a baseline examination for those patients and actually for all patients, like a basic cardiac assessment uh, at the booking appointment or at the first appointment um, to just be sure that there is nothing going on that you're missing. So rheumatic heart disease is something that can always be a diagnosis and can explain cardiac diseases and it can get worse in pregnancy. So we should always be aware of it um, and always just have that baseline cardiac assessment at the um, very early appointment in pregnancy. So um, diagnosis. So basically uh, cardiac diseases are a little bit different than other medical disorders that we discussed because there is a good chance that the first diagnosis is made in pregnancy, which I mean, basically it's if, if the patient has a known congenital heart disease, that's okay. If the patient has a known rheumatic heart disease, that's okay. Then you manage as we will discuss later, but sometimes the patient is okay. And all of a sudden she develops something in pregnancy, some acute event, probably the most important is, or the most common that we, think of is myocardial infarction. So in this part of the lecture, I will talk more about diagnoses that may be made at the time of pregnancy. So they are not there when you start your assessment at the booking appointment, you think she's doing okay, but all of a sudden in the middle of pregnancy, she's developing symptoms. So I would like to emphasize on the expectation, like what could, ha what could happen in pregnancy how we manage it and how we um, like investigate and make diagnosis out of it. So basically one of the things is myocardial infarction because um, sometimes, I mean, as obstetricians, we don't think about myocardial infarction. I mean, we think always that it's, you know, it's like a, an elderly condition. It's our population is healthy. They are young um, and, so it's very unlikely for them to have myocardial infarction, but that's not true. And it's always good to recognize what risk factors you may notice when, you, um, when you're dealing with a particular patient. So for myocardial infarction, if a pregnant lady is above the age of 40, that's a risk factor. If the patient is having hypertension or diabetes in the background, that's a risk factor. If the patient is smoking, that's a risk factor. If the patient is known to have hyperlipidemia, sometimes she's not tested for it, but if she's known, she starts to do some checkups and she's known to have hyperlipidemia, that's a risk factor. Pregnancy itself is a risk factor and it can increase the risk by three to four times. So we should understand with myocardial infarction that our pregnancy is actually a risk factor. So you should be aware, I mean, not saying that it's exclusive, but definitely if you see a patient that's above 40, hypertensive, um, high body mass index, diabetes, like all these classics, like, you know, risk factors, and she's pregnant. Yes, myocardial infarction is definitely one of the diagnoses, but a diagnosis of what? Um, typically, um, those patients come with chest pain and chest pain is very annoying in pregnancy. I mean, chest pain could be nothing, could be just some GERD, should be just muscle pain. But there are definitely two things we, we always do want to mess. The first one is PE or pulmonary embolism, definitely because of the increased risk of VTE in pregnancy. Uh, and the other thing is cardiac events. And on the top of it is myocardial infarction. So whenever you're confronted with chest pain, just put myocardial infarction as one of the differential diagnoses. Definitely, um, there may be other symptoms like shortness of breath, some tachycardia, some other things going on. But I mean, chest pain by itself should be worrisome um, especially if it doesn't look like anything else or if it doesn't match with the other um, conditions. And just bear in mind, myocardial infarction is something you need to diagnose very fast. So it's not like you're waiting two or three days to rule out other causes. You should, if you have any suspicion, even if it's very small of myocardial infarction, you can definitely and easily rule that out. And the way we rule it out uh, in those patients is actually to do an ECG, plus or minus, 
really dimensions of suspicion and the findings from the ECG, you can do a troponin I to start with. Bear in mind, CT and MRI are sometimes indicated, but they're not indicated for myocardial infarction, basically. They're not used to diagnose myocardial infarction. But if you think chest pain does look very concerning to you, which means that the pain is really significant, she's really in a significant pain from her chest, that's not usual. And one of the signs or one of the symptoms, if she's describing that this pain is radiating to the back, like going all the way through the chest, going to the back, this is one of the other um, concerning features, that this could be an aortic dissection. So if you have any suspicion of aortic dissection, just definitely get cardiology on, um, on board and do a CT slash MRI. But um, to rule out myocardial infarction, you're going to start with an ECG, obviously, and troponin 1, which is our troponin I, which is actually one of the good markers to um, diagnose myocardial infarction. I just want to mention something. I don't want to be really <laughs> going into internal medicine or trying to go for cardiology, um, but I'm trying to just give some information that probably um, will be helpful uh, when you're doing these tests. So with troponin I, we're typically doing a series. So the series means that you're doing a troponin at presentation when, when the patient comes with a chest pain. So that's the baseline one. And you do another one, typically after three hours, three to six hours is okay from the onset of symptoms, ideally after three hours. And if they are negative, you can do another one after six hours. So you complete the series. That's because actually troponin, I mean, as you see in this figure, it's like you see this red line, there's a red line and a gray line. So the red line basically referring to uh, when there's a large MI, that gray one is when it's small. So either way, this is like the days. So troponin doesn't go up very fast, but it stays for a long time, which is one of the most um, useful features of it. So. If you do it at presentation, three to six hours after, um, it may catch it, but if they are negative, you wanna be sure that it, it's not like building up and then you have to repeat after six hours. As I mentioned, it starts to increase within three to 12 hours after the event itself. And it reaches the maximum as we see here after one to two days. And then it starts to go down between five uh, to 14 days going back to the baseline. So there is a good window for you to catch it. But if you do it very early, sometimes you don't catch it. Um, and you want to catch it as early as possible as well. I mean, you can wait for three or four days, but this is not good, right? Um, so that's why you're doing this series to start with. And for how to use this information, like when you send troponin, and it's negative, fine. But if it's positive, it's high. Uh, it really depends on how high it is and if it's changing in this series, because I mean, sometimes it's high, but it's stable, meaning maybe it just, you know, it's slightly high, it's stable, maybe just a small myocardial infarction, or it's really high and it's building up, which means that the process is still ongoing and there's significant myocardial infarction. But either way, you have to definitely talk to cardiology about it. They should be on board because you're not the person who's supposed to make decisions based on troponin, but you definitely should order it yourself just to save time and just, you know, because you don't want to just ask cardiology to come and they come and then they ask for troponin, which is thank you. I mean, that's, that's just a waste of time. It's better for them to come when you have some blood test cooking um, to just have some information in addition to the clinical assessment and definitely ECG can give you like more information about what's going on as well. So um, the other one is peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is a very significant condition in pregnancy. Again, peripartum cardiomyopathy has a different presentation. So you get worried for those patients who come with symptoms that look like heart failure, basically shortness of breath. And you should always ask, I mean, when the patient comes with shortness of breath, it's important to know if it's a constant or intermittent, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Um, typically for a cardiac patient, it definitely 
um, gets worse when the patient is laying flat. And when she stands up, that probably um, makes it get better. Not necessarily that's resolved, but gets better. So that positional thing could be a clue that this is probably a heart failure problem. Definitely there are other things, like you see the patient is swollen, like she's describing like an ankle swelling, definitely happens in pregnancy, but it's really getting significantly increasing. If you listen to her chest, there's some sort of evidence that she's having pulmonary edema, some crackles on the chest could be another clue to it. So the typical picture of a heart failure is what we um, get concerned about. And you should be aware of the risk factors. Again, it's not that she has risk factors, that is a diagnosis. She doesn't have risk factors that rules out diagnosis. It doesn't work this way, of course, but just, you know, like these, you know, red flags just make you um, more aware of the situation, basically. So a patient that is, um, I would say more than 30 years. So age is a, is a factor here. Definitely multiple pregnancy or multifeasor pregnancy, twins and more, is a risk factor. Parity adds to the risk factor. So most significant, similar to myocardial infarction, is hypertension. Actually, 25% of those patients have hypertension. So hypertension is a very significant risk. Poor nutrition and African descent. So just be aware of these risk factors because they really can be of something. So the most common is age, parity, hypertension, multifetal pregnancy. As I said, they present with, with symptoms that look like heart failure and you want to know what's going on. The primary thing is likely shortness of breath. So you can do the stuff that you do for shortness of breath, chest X-ray, but you will do ECG as well and you will do echocardiography. And these are the three things that you have to do with those types of patients, right? Uh, so ECG, chest X-ray, and echocardiography is how we start. So peripartum cardiomyopathy, as I said, it's, it's a condition related to pregnancy and it's significant, I would say. Uh, to know if it's really peripartum cardiomyopathy slash other diagnoses, I would say there are three things that make the criteria of diagnosis. So the first thing that the patient comes with typical manifestations, symptoms and signs of heart failure, as I mentioned, shortness of breath, swelling of the feet and legs, pulmonary edema, like lung crackles, tachycardia, abnormal heart sounds, things like that. But she should come within the last month of pregnancy, likely, or within five months after delivery, which is very important. So even after delivery, that counts. So just recently before she delivers or within five months after she delivers the baby, this one side. So it's really within the, like the peripartum time um, is when these symptoms start and develop and get worse. You do an echo and then you find that the ejection fraction, which as we know, cardiac output by, by um, uh, heart rate is one important indicator. So normally it should be 55 to 70. If it's less than 45, that and, and we're talking basically on the left ventricle so you know that's uh, definitely a heart failure so that's a cardiomyopathy and this goes with a diagnosis as well so she has the symptoms ejection fraction is low less than 45 and you can't find any other reason why she's having this heart failure typically she doesn't have any history of like myocardial infections or like cardiac diseases like she doesn't have anything cardiac going on and this is her first diagnosis with any cardiac problem is when you say okay that's the third criteria now we know that's likely peripartum cardiomyopathy and you should take it seriously and this needs cardiology attention we're not treating this so uh rheumatic heart disease again typically the patient should be known to have rheumatic heart disease but in many situations that's not what's happening the patient is not known to have heart diseases because she has never been um, investigated. She may have baseline symptoms, but she never um, like had uh, medical care or like sought medical advice. So she doesn't know what's going on. She knows she has some shortness of breath or sometimes she's doing fine, but pregnancy itself just aggravated the symptoms. Uh, so any patient, I would say 
like poverty is one of the risk factors. Lack of access to medical care is a risk factor coming from areas where rheumatic heart disease is more prevalent as a risk factor, definitely. Um, symptoms that you, you should be really thinking about is similar to any cardiac symptoms, shortness of breath, when lying flat, same thing, similar to what we said in peripartum cardiomyopathy, anything that looks like cardiac symptoms is basically it. And what you need to do, same thing, just X-ray, ACG, and echocardiography. So basically, it's similar to the assessment for, a peri for the peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, always just do a baseline cardiac assessment, listen to the heart, listen to the chest, ask about the history, um, ask about the symptoms, be sure at the booking appointment that she is clear when she presents. So you can actually compare whatever happens later on to the baseline that she has. Um, okay, so that was basically the some few conditions that we get concerned about. And sometimes we are the ones who start to catch them um, at the time of pregnancy. So going back to our like usual algorithm, what we do in pregnancy is basically stage one, preconception, stage two, antenatal care, stage three, intrapartum care, stage four, postpartum care. Um, so preconception care, basically and ideally, when a patient is known to have, uh, you know, like a cardiac problem, basically. So if the patient is known to have um, I mean, ideally, if the patient is known to have a cardiac problem after puberty, she should be really seeing um, a combined team of cardiologists and obstetricians. Just to explain things, just to talk about contraception, just to talk about, you know, the expectations, how this would affect her productive, like reproductive life, things like that. Uh, when she's already there and she's planning to get pregnant, you need to see her preconception to talk about, to talk about few things. And it's basically what are the risks on her? What are the risks on the baby? How the antenatal care will be going? So that's definitely something you need to do. And the question is always about, especially with congenital heart diseases, like uh, what are the risks on my baby? Is the baby going to have the same problem? And fortunately, in most situations, these cardiac problems are multifactorial. They are really not commonly inherited to the baby. But we always say there's an increased risk over the baseline that we should consider. And uh, based on that, we do, you know, if you have a congenital heart disease, um, we check about the family history, of course, but we typically do a fetal echocardiography for the baby at the time of the anatomy scan, just for reassurance. So that's what you promise her, is we going to check um, around the time of like 18 to 21 weeks to see how the baby is doing. So uh, if you don't have any like recent assessment of this lady and you're seeing her in a preconception appointment, you should assess clinically and you, um, are likely to ask for an echocardiography um, because there are certain risk factors or certain clinical um, conditions that you will probably advise against getting pregnant. And you should be aware of these conditions, especially if you see her in a preconception appointment. Sometimes if you see this in an early booking appointment, you should um, consider like miscarriage sometimes just based on what um, is a clinical situation. So the most common situation when we say, okay, that's not good for you to get pregnant and this can really endanger you and increase the risk of mortality in some situations going to up, 50, to, up to 50% is bladders with Marfan syndrome, as we mentioned, not all Marfan syndromes, but Marfan syndrome was a dilated aortic root, which is like more than four centimeters. That's because that can increase risk of aortic dissection, as we discussed. And aortic dissection is really an extremely dangerous situation. It can kill right away. So um, this is one of the things. Pulmonary hypertension, no doubt. And 
uh, conditions of like, you know, left ventricular um, outflow obstruction, which like things related to, you know, like things like aortic stenosis, basically. If you think that the pressure is more than, um, you know, 30 millimeters mercury is basically in the left ventricle. Uh, if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 30%, this is another contraindication. So Marfan syndrome was a dilated aortic root, pulmonary hypertension, ejection fraction in the left ventricle is less than 30%, or significant obstruction of the outflow from the left ventricle, making the pressure more than 30 millimeter uh, mercury. And this is definitely something that you need to do with a cardiologist. You're not just asking for investigations, you're just sending her for assessment by cardiology, highlighting what you're looking for and what could be the contraindications um, for her to get pregnant. Um, and in those patients, you should be really strict about the risk. It's not just like we're not recommending, it's like it's high mortality rate for you basically. And definitely if it's for you, it's for the baby as well. So, um, if you're seeing this patient in early pregnancy, so that's the poking appointment, if you haven't done what you should have done in the uh, preconception appointment, do it. Investigate any contraindications to pregnancy, discuss miscarriage. I mean, you know, uh, if you're planning for a miscarriage, it would be early, it shouldn't be late, basically. So early in pregnancy, uh, you should always establish a team at the beginning of pregnancy for the first assessment by cardiology, obstetricians, and definitely anesthesia. Uh, to discuss what's going on, what's the cardiac history. This is for patients who are known to have cardiac problems. What are the problem? Um, what's a cardiac defect? What has been done? What are the recent investigations? Are there any like murmurs we can see or hear uh, basically with risk assessment? If the patient is low risk, doesn't seem that she has any active problem, like she has a congenital heart disease that was surgically corrected and she's doing fine since then, that's okay. She can be on routine obstetric care. But there, if there is any high risk, like conditions, significant conditions, as the ones we mentioned earlier, she should have like a close follow-up, basically, um, in antenatal care clinic. Each time she should be seen by an obstetric consultant and hopefully the same one. And um, she should undergo assessment as we will discuss later. So in the subsequent visits, as we mentioned earlier, she is planned to have a second trimester or a mid-trimester anatomy scan, that's typical. But if she has a history of congenital heart disease herself, then definitely needs a fetal echocardiography to be done. Sometimes we have to do that if there is like a significant family history of cardiac diseases as well, um, is that we have to uh, do a fetal echocardiography. Uh, cardiovascular assessment. Um, so each time you see the patient in antenatal care, you should manually check the blood pressure. You should check any change in the murmurs, like listen to the heart, not only the blood pressure, blood pressure, listen to the heart, check the pulse, be sure that the rhythm and the volume of the pulse is okay, because any change in the pulse volume or rhythm could be an early sign that there is an overload, she's going to heart failure, or there is something else going on, okay? And you definitely have, have um, to listen to the chest and assess for the signs of pulmonary edema. So you're basically listening to the heart. You wanna be sure that the heart is okay. There's no like change in the murmurs or anything. You're listening to the chest, you're checking the blood pressure and you're checking the pulse and rhythm. So just think about it like heart, lungs, arms for the blood pressure and then prefer for the pulse. This is how you assess. Um, if the patient is known to have a congenital heart disease that has a cyanotic nature, this is definitely one of the highest risk factors to the mother and the baby. And then basically you have to, um, each time you see the patient, you have to check for, a, um, for oxygen saturation. And for those patients, typically, you're likely to be concerned about the risk of, uh, you know, like a fetal growth. Uh, restriction or something like that and then you have to do serial ultrasounds to just be sure that the baby is growing in the um, normal um, range. Again, um, it's typical at the beginning of the third trimester that you should have a multidisciplinary team that's very important between you, the cardiology, the anesthesia, all the team and you set a plan, a written plan, documented plan about everything related to pregnancy. 
So like the plan for delivery, how we're going to deliver, if we have to do a C-section, is it safe or not? Um, is she safe to bear down um, in the second trimesters, like to push in the second, sorry, in the second stage of labor or not? Um, and if we have to cut short the second stage, like by doing an instrumental delivery, what we're going to do um, to manage postpartum hemorrhage, because um, some medications may be not suitable, like ergometrin may not be suitable for the heart. Oxytocin itself at high volumes can really cause hypotension, and this is dangerous on the perfusion of the heart. Um, so that's something really depends on the severity of the condition and what's the diagnosis exactly. Vena thromboembolism, are you planning to do any prophylaxis for that? How long she should be staying in hospital? And what's the follow-up plan with cardiology? Uh, like when the cardiology needs to see her, is it immediately while she's in hospital or after she's discharged from the hospital? Or like what exactly is the follow-up plan? So these are very important things, really dependent on the severity. And you don't take the decision yourself. You need a cardiologist and you need to share these questions and discussion with them. Um, managing a labor. So very few tricks, I would say. It's not significantly different than any management of labor, but there are like key things. And the key thing here is you don't want the patient to be really stressed, like putting more stress over the heart. And at the same time, you're trying to avoid hypotension because a hypotension basically decreases the cardiac perfusion and this can increase cardiac complications. And what can cause hypotension basically? Two major things. So the first thing is epidural. Not saying that you shouldn't be doing epidural, but it should be really slow, gradual epidural because it's, you know, Otherwise, it can cause significant hypotension, which is going to be very dangerous to the heart. So that's something the anesthesia should plan for. And the other thing that can cause hypotension is oxytocin. And we do oxytocin either for induction of labor or augmentation of labor, or we do it for postpartum hemorrhage. So for, for induction or augmentation, there are two regimens very known. is a low-dose regimen, which is more popular, to be honest, and the high-dose regimen. And the low dose regimen means you're starting with two units uh, per minute uh, and increase, like when you're doing induction or augmentation, you start with two units and start increasing that rate by two every 30 minutes. Your maximum is 40. Sometimes you don't go to 40, some just restricted to 20 or 30, depending on the place. Uh, while the high dose regimen is actually starting by six and increasing it by six every 20 minutes, not even 30 minutes, and they go up to 292. Uh, so in some institutes, many institutes, to be honest, the low dose uh, oxytocin regimen is the one that's used. But, you know, if uh, you're doing a high dose regimen, this is not recommended in those particular patients. You have to be on the low dose regimen and be very cautious um, with your limits. Uh, the other thing is with postpartum hemorrhage, you are, you are, you know, unlikely to use ergometrin. Um, and if you're doing oxytocin, you should be doing it very cautiously. Use the lowest dose possible. And that's for vaginal delivery. But if you're doing a C-section, you should overthink if you're really concerned. I mean, if you are not just doing it for prophylaxis, I mean, if you think you're having postpartum hemorrhage, then mechanical ways like compression sutures, like P-Lynch particularly, um, would be the best option to avoid giving her like, you know, ergometrin, which you shouldn't be typically using, or high doses of uh, oxytocin, which again, you shouldn't be really using. Um, just remember, uh, bleeding itself, postpartum hemorrhage, adds to the hypotension. And this is probably the third factor that can cause hypotension that you should protect the patient from having. So epidural, oxytocin, and um, uh, definitely postpartum hemorrhage. So that's particularly it. I know it's, it has been really a very shallow discussion. I didn't go really into deep details, um, but this is basically intentional as we're just trying to uh, sets a bar for all cardiac patients. We may um, have to go for like, you know, particular lectures for certain conditions like myocardial infarction to be more specific and to give more details about them. 
Uh, but what we described here is probably applicable to most of the cardiac um, conditions that we see. Uh, the key here is actually you should be working with a team. You shouldn't be working with yourself. You should be working with cardiology, anesthesia in every single stage of this care. And that was it. And thank you for um, watching the lecture.